Uh, hi, my name's Kevin Ogilvy, aka Ogre, um, the lead singer from Skinny Puppy. Uh, we've been a performance art electronic band that's been together since 1983. Uh, the initial concept of the idea of the band was uh, light through a dog's eyes, or um, those who are mutable um, have only the chance to really speak out through a loud bark and sometimes an unintelligible bark. So um, we've covered everything from uh, uh, the Exxon Valdez to environmental pollution to uh, drug addiction uh, to um, uh, the NSA spying to whatever ills are in the world. We had a respite during the Clinton administration and when Bush came back into office we were back in full swing. Although now I tend to see things more as a, as a centrist sort of government in this country. So um, I've seen uh, ills and uh, and uh, you know a disservice done from both sides of the, of the, uh, uh, the political spectrum. No, I, th I think there's there's always I think you know sometimes hypocrisy is is the only way to change. So I think you know accepting you know whatever hypocrisy that you stumble upon or learn and see it as that allows you to change and progress. So so no, we've uh, certainly you know changed subtly within our constructs and concepts. I think one. Um, earlier on concept that I always had about information and this new age of media and reporting was, you know, I was there when CNN first came online and I've been a news junkie. I've watched every news station there is. I kind of am addicted to it and still to this day. It's like my babysitter in a way. And so I saw CNN as, uh, we had an idea in, in the eighties of a time when, and we used to cut film for our live shows very fast cuts, you know, high level information transfer. And I thought that, that was going to transpose into um, news media with all of these 24 hour news channels coming on that would go very in depth into everything so that people would have a chance to make it up their own mind. And I was uh, never more wrong about that in the sense that you know, what really became was, uh, you know, a system by which, uh, you know, there's so many different angles on any one story that the confusion tumbles down into the Occam's razor where people accept kind of the most easily and most you know, palatable um, suggestion about what's happening. And so I, I tend to see it as, as a, a horde of confusion as opposed to what I'd hoped for, which would be um, something that was very in your face, allowing you to see every angle of every news story possible with all of the bandwidth that was available. I mean, I can only go by what I've experienced and what I think I've learned throughout life and, and uh, you know, I think, you know, something that stuck with me right from the beginning was early writings, or not writings, but the trans transcriptions of Krishnamurti, which kind of threw dogma aside and, you know, don't believe anything you read or see unless you experience it to a certain degree. And although I, I, I am one step removed from a lot of what goes on in the world in the sense of, um, I'm not in the Middle East. When I was very young, I had no concept of the Middle East, so I've learned, and, and still to this day, I'm, I'm, I'm just as confused about the Middle East and, and a lot of its um, priorities and a lot of the, um, you know, the directions that um, our own, um, you know, our own foreign policy takes within those regions. It's very confusing, although it's becoming clearer and clearer to me as time goes on, a little bit, you know. And then you go back to kind of colonial, you know, rule in countries where they, you know, the, 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 the basic idea is to go in, find the minority, give them all the power, so that when they want to exit, they can create a civil war and let them eat themselves alive, you know. And so I see, you know, I see how these mechanisms work, and I see how there is blowback, and there is reasons why things exist here now that are coming to our shore, and I think that in a lot of ways, maybe people are playing catch up slowly to all of these things, but I, I sometimes think not as well. It's, yeah, <laughs> sorry. It's very sometimes it's very So if you have such a great and strong and true opinion on everything that you cover from your real life and your band, where do you derive your morality from? Uh, from empathy, purely and simply. I, I um, come from an abused background where it would have either gone one way or the other. I would have either become a sociopath uh, and victimized other people or developed, in my case, a great amount of empathy, which at times is a burden. Um, you know, I tend to rescue wasps and bees out of uh, bird baths after they get too drunk on our, on our nectar for the hummingbirds. I'm feeding squirrels every day and quail. Um, 
I waste a lot of time rescuing flies that are bashing their heads against the window. So I have a, um, maybe it's a flaw, but I can tend to personify these things. And uh, I've always thought there is a greater consciousness in animals than what we've been led to believe. And certainly, you know, as far as even, I think that was my first questioning with even biblical, you know, um, thought in the sense that there was a time, I guess, when, way back when, when we all lived in peace with animals, but then suddenly animals became our possessions and had no souls or whatever a soul is. But to me, I see it as a consciousness. I see it as a perceptive consciousness. And I've always seen within animals a different range of perception from us, but a very conscious range and, and, uh, and, and a very deep conscious range as well. So and I guess I, I, I think that sometimes, you know, continues on this commodification of animals to use within the medical industry at any time in history. You know, animals have been used as models or as a commodity in order to um, fulfill um, a almost, I guess, religion, a blood religion by which, you know, certain people going into the medical field will become doctors and will deal with people and will follow the Hippocratic Oath. And some people will follow another path through research because maybe they're not really into people <laughs> or helping people. And so animals then become a commodity for that, for that, um, you know, kind of almost, I guess, uh, um, malicious form of, of, uh, of, of testing. There, there's gallows laughter. I notice that a lot in, in a lot of the things that I talk about sometimes to my disdain on camera. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I mean, I've lived with these things for a long time and, and, and there is kind of, I think, a gallows laughter within it all. It's the only way that I can really deal. I've never been able to really process correctly the things that we do to animals. A lot of it I can't look at when it comes to factory farming or, uh, or uh, you know, again, the, the, the way that we've... Uh, uh, I, again, it all comes back in ourselves. We, we stuff them full of antibiotics. Suddenly we have um, a resistance to antibiotics and it's never, it's never pushed back to that point of origin where we see that you know, what we deal with on lower levels affects us at a higher level. And same with Fukushima. It's like we're not seeing that we're poisoning our own, our own back, backyards you know, with, with what's going on with, with nuclear power and our resistance to accept it as, as uh, what it truly is, which is probably one of the dirtiest forms of energy um, ever in this planet. I mean, it's something completely foreign to our planet, so. I mean, when you're talking about all these emotions and all these facts that are upsetting you, that are poisoning people that you love, how do you translate that into your art? But what's more so a question towards your process is the song making in Skinny Puppy is that little reductive where you have this great big galaxy of ideas and sounds and lyrics and you sort of chip away at it like marble until you have a song? Or is it this one point of thought and you branch off like a constellation? I guess it's it's a bit it's a bit of an ab yeah abstracting things. You know, I've always been um, interested in looking at abstracts, not direct. With the, this album, Weapon, that we just did, it began as a um, reaction to what we heard from a soldier uh, working in Guantanamo who was playing our music, but uh, soon became more of an abstract at looking at weapons all around us sitting wide open, you know, and nuclear power became one of those abstracts to me of a weapon that again was um, sold to the public in the last century as cheap, you know, uh, energy that would come off the, the grid unmetered practically and, and very clean. And the underlying uh, reason for that um, hogwash and that snake oil salesman to the, to the public was a weapons program. I can't say that I've done everything right, but I've been, you know, I've dealt with my folly and, and my foibles my whole life, and I'm not a perfect person by any means. I'm a flawed person um, by my own self-loathing. Uh, Oppenheimer cried after he did what he did. And, uh, and uh, you know, I think that there's a, there's, there's, there's a result in everything that's both positive and negative. And in this case, um, when I was asked about our music being used as torture, my first... Um, my first thought was, well, why wouldn't it be, you know, to a certain degree? It's, it's very dissonant and, uh, and uh, I could see where it would affect people who are unaware of its meaning in a negative way. So I certainly didn't have any apprehension when I heard about it being used, but uh, again, was more infuriated in the practice of using sound, whether it be Skinny Puppy, Barney, or Sesame Street, you know, at high volumes, anything at high volume, 
for six to 12 hours. And then we're talking very high volume, distorted high volume for six to 12 hours in a cold room with somebody lying prostrate and, you know, handcuffed at the ankles, having cold water pour, poured on them until they defecate or urinate themselves. And then uh, to be paraded further is inhuman to me. So, I mean, we're one tiny slice of all of that. Um, and again, you know, I grew up uh, in a time uh, post World War II where America and the American soldiers were looked upon as the good guys. And, you know, a Marine was somebody that somebody in any country could walk up to for help, or so I was told. And I kind of believed that in the Second World War to a certain degree. I'm sure there was some, you know, some improper action, but you're seeing um, whether it's projected or even within the troops themselves, there's a slant on their on their morals that's taking place. And it started, I think, in Vietnam, and probably before, but, you know, with the my Lai massacre and all of that stuff and uh, and uh, you know has progressed now to where even you know I've talked to some ex Navy SEALs who are enraged that they're being um, in a way demonized you know by their own country you know to a certain degree yeah. right and again this falls under the eyes the, uh, the the auspices of of these new speak words such as rendition or of um, you know enhanced interrogation and uh, you know, at the very end of it, it's, um, it's the, the overriding arch is the idea of non-lethal weapons. And so you can, you can take a laser on a battlefield and blind, you know, 100,000 soldiers and they're still alive. So it's, it's non-lethal, but their lives are completely horrible from that point on. So, and it still exists today. I mean, COINTELPRO is, is almost like, a, you know, a corporate entity in America. Yeah. You know, you're talking about privatized military, and, and again, you, you like get back to the idea of how do we find the truth in all this? Well, you have freedom of information requests, but um, most things now are privatized. So, with the military industrial complex being so privatized, freedom of information requests no longer apply. So, you've got a perfect mechanism for hiding and conspiracy. You know, to see that the people I love and support your music do not be proud of something like that, or of a revelation that was for news for fortune. Every time I've seen or I've met your fans talk and the subject's brought up and anyone tries to make light of it, there's always a very stern word coming down saying, no, this is not why we listen to Skinny Puppy and we're not going to wear it as a badge of honor. And made to where a lot of musicians or a lot of politicians are posturing and trying to use threatening rhetoric and to be known as a, as a brutal person. When that's glamorized, right. it's so beautiful to see the exact opposite. Well, we try, <laughs> and and you know I think our fans really try to. I think mean, I think the one thing about you know our fan base is that there are a lot of again similar to myself, very and you know people with a lot of empathy that um, you know see these things and feel powerless to say something until this forum opens up. So you know we can thank you as well in the same in the same instance for for allowing us a forum to talk about all of this. And again, we're just, uh, with regards to the Gitmo story, I mean, you know, we had, uh, you know, first stumbled upon this in 2011 and worked out the concept that's been, you know, ruminating around in my consciousness or unconsciousness for three years. And uh, when I did press for the album, it didn't really catch. I don't know why it caught. We didn't really, Kevin said one sentence in a Phoenix Times article to promote this tour and it just took off from there. So we got kind of blindsided by the whole thing. Uh, but it did give us the ability to kind of get back in touch with Terry Holbrooks and, um, you know, bring, bring this back to, to the light. And he's suffering from post-traumatic stress himself. And uh, so to, to me, it's, it's really all of this stuff, whether it's the documentary we did for the greater wrong of the right in our video in 2004, that Bill Morrison, who is the guitar player in my solo band, Ogre, and played guitar for Skinny Puppy, He's a documentary filmmaker. We did uh, a short documentary where we had interviews with Ramsey Clark and uh, with Steve Robinson from the Gulf War Veterans Administration talking about the use of depleted uranium as, as, uh, as tank busters on the battlefield and just how it was so dangerous for the men and women on the ground, not the officers, but the men and women. And, and in this case, too, I, I just noticed that you know, we're defending the prisoners at Gitmo, but we're also defending the, the soldiers who have empathy that go into a situation that they're totally unprepared for and are affected by it to such a degree that some of them are suicidal. 
some of them kill themselves. Uh, it, it, the, the list goes on and on. I mean, the, the range of mental problems that they come back with trying to adjust, you know, it's that jarhead philosophy in a lot of ways, you know, and you see that. And it's, it's, it's those people that I'm kind of most concerned about because, you know, they're the ones that are, um, are you know, are, have, have the empathy and are trying to do the right thing over there or going for a just cause or whatever they think is a just cause. Okay. Well, I think within within the Gitmo thing, I think, um, you know, I've tried to, well, I actually haven't tried to, but I think rallying our fans to start petitions and, and write their senators, write their write their governors, you know, I mean, I'm I'm a green card holder down here, so I pay my taxes down here, and I, I've lived down here longer than I lived in my hometown. I spend more time in America than I have in any city that I've been in Canada, but I have no real right to, um, you know, sign a petition or... I guess I can, but I'm not a citizen. So I would I would encourage people to become more active um, and uh, and do those things, you know, and raise a stink, you know, call, call out, you know, bark. <laughs> well, not even as a um, the green card member in America, but as a citizen of the world. What do you think this country's global responsibility is, if there is any? Well, I think it's it's twofold. I think the first thing is that. Um, I had an interesting experience in um, in 2001 on September 11th. I left the country the night before and went to Amsterdam. And I arrived uh, with my girlfriend at the time's um, father's brother saying America's under attack. And I spent two months over there and uh, talked to a lot of young people who were very well aware of the sectarian violence in Iraq, knew about the Sunnis, knew about the Shias, knew about the Kurds. And then I came back here to this surreal vision of nationalism twisted with patriotism and twisted with we're going to get you and, you know, flags on cars and, and talking to kids like no idea of anything going on over there until it was appropriate enough for the, for the government to, again, exit the situation and create this sectarian violence or let it just fold in on itself. So, um, I think education, education, education is the one thing. I think, you know, a generation of kids have been dumbed down for whatever reason. I think it's obviously it's cheaper to incarcerate than it is to educate in America. And with the prison systems being privatized, you know, I, I could go into, you know, a, a slew of conspiracies based around that that even goes back to the idea of gangster rap. And I, I don't know if this is true or not, but, you know, there's a, you know, at one time I've heard through various sources that there is, um, a meeting between intelligence and record executives to really promote gangster rap to try and get kids into it and into jails, you know, to fill jails. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, you know, I don't know. I, I can neither confirm nor deny it, but it sounds exactly. tragically logical to me in a lot of ways, much in the same way that um, right now, you know, with the drought in California and, and uh, us not having any rain and this polar vortex, if you believe in any kind of weather modification, if you do believe in that, if you do believe that the HARP system is able to generate gigawatts of microwave energy and put it up in the ionosphere and actually move the jet stream, well, then it kind of makes sense that if they push it up into the Aleutian Islands, it's going to come down even farther into America. So I, I see things as those kind of logical steps that to me make sense, but somebody would just call me a tinfoil head at that point, you know? Well. I'm going to have to do a lot of research and investigation on this point. So I don't know if I'll make a final point. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. But beyond this interview... I was very proud of that album. And, and uh, again, you know, I've worked with someone. I'm, I'm lucky enough to work with people that are um, very close. So it's not like a team of, of unknown people. They're people that are friends. Mark Walk, I, I met when we recorded the process. And we remain friends, very close friends to this day. So it's, um, it's a family sort of thing in a way. And... Uh, Again, psychologically, he knows me as much as I know him, so we're able to kind of complete each other's sentences. So working together on that record was a joy, you know, absolute joy. And then having Bill Mosley come in and do some of his... Uh, he uh, When I was working with him on Repo the Genetic Opera, I realized what an incredible voice he is. He wrote for um, Omni, and, uh, so and, and, and it, 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 uh, he interviewed Edward Teller, at one point in time and did a, a piece on cattle mutilations, you know, and, uh, you know, he's, he's an incredibly tele, you know, intelligent, Yale-educated guy, and, uh, and he writes amazing poetry, and so to get him on there was another kind of flavor for that record. How do you achieve, when you're working with other people, when you're dealing with such hard trust issues, that 
every one of your members must have a very, very focused opinion they do on. How do you keep that from being asymmetrical? Would the perfect skinny puppy record be like a bell curve, a little bit of yourself, a little bit of your Mr. Key, and then a share of ideas? Or does sometimes it end up in the power line? And I mean, I, I, I hate to say it, it's the power line. Kevin's always kind of taking one step back from the um, conceptual side of the albums and um, takes more control of, of the sonic side of the albums musically. And although um, he certainly agrees with a lot of the things I say, he's um, a little more tentative about getting as impassioned as I do about, um, you know, the content and things like that and, and um, focuses more on um, the sound design and, and things like that. No, I think we've always kind of stuck it out there. There's things that I can even go back on that... Um, um, I, the odd thing about I think the, the way that I write lyrics, for example, is that sometimes through abstraction you discover things years later within the lyric that seems to make more sense now than it, than it even did then. You know, um, uh, VX Cast Attack for me was something that I was learning. I was trying to figure out what was going on and I was young so I, I didn't have the base of information that I have now. But when I look back on it, it was it was a fairly good stab into something that, that um, still resonates. But there is there is a lot of mixtures of things within it that maybe I would um, tend to separate a bit more now. So what were you, so let's elaborate on that because I'm very curious to hear that. What was it about that song? Was it the topic you were covering that you feel you didn't know enough about? Um, well, at, at that time, I wasn't aware that, um, for example, that Rumsfeld was the one that, <laughs> that actually okay. sold. Uh, sold uh, uh, Saddam Hussein all the chemical weapons that were used to both use on his own people and fight against Iran. Um, so I was, I was, uh, I was con again, confused about uh, the religious, the, the um, you know, sectarian versus the, the more um, 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 religious side of things over there. And, and, uh, and again, I was, I was uh, grossly unaware of the um, tampering that was being done. And so all of that was kind of instinctively, you know, uh, pushed at, at this one person, Saddam Hussein, without seeing the, you know, the back issues. And it wasn't until I think a few years later with the shaking of Rumsfeld's hand and realizing that, you know, a lot of these things, like you say with Al Qaeda, you know, was basically a, a manufactured, it, it could even be a ghost like you know, group of people that was basically put in to run the Russians out of Afghanistan. Or even, you know, uh, I mean, in bringing up to forward, when I, when I was overseas, I told you after 9-11, um, we were in Italy when the Buddha statues got bombed, and, and you know, that was a great pretext to, to start bombing Afghanistan, and I'm still confused about all of that as to what, what the truth is behind that. You know, and then it goes into even deeper now with the fact that, um, uh, you know, uh, at that time, uh, when the Taliban was in control, um, heroin sales were going, heroin was very expensive here. And now that we've taken it back over, heroin is, is a scourge of heroin again in this country. And it's, it's, it, I was shocked to see how cheap it is. And I'm an, I'm not a, I was never a, a complete user of heroin. I dabbled with it. I was scared of it because in Vancouver we had very strong stuff coming in from Asia. But... Um, but I was certainly aware of it, and it was very expensive. And now you're looking at six dollars, you know, for a for a bundle, and and you know that's something that's a direct result of our of our um, dabbling in Afghanistan. I think we are the the conduit for all of that coming over here. And obviously, there's a lot of money being made by the military running drugs for black projects, and uh, you know I think that's been proven by the cocaine cowboys, and I'm sure it. It didn't disappear after that film came out, you know. There's, I'm gonna get in trouble with all the stuff we we're talking about. But, <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna have some presents. Well, I mean, our our initial reaction was to make an album called Weapon that would have a narrative and songs, and we would explore all of the frequencies used to torture and make segments to torture with a handbook, like a kid's handbook of like put mask on now, put hood on now, start music. And within the music to used to torture, um, we would include uh, subliminals in different dialects saying, although this music sounds terrible, 
and it seems to be hurting you, please understand that in our country it's used to fight the very thing that's hurting you. The, 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 the worst part about what was being used in Guantanamo was they weren't even using actual recordings or using bootleg recordings of the songs. They're already staticky, you know, white noisy, horribly recorded recordings at high volume. So that's what you should be using for your, for your demo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when we did the greater wrong of the right and we had contacts with the Gulf Wars Veterans Administration and uh, interviews with Ramsey Clark, we made a number of contacts and kind of went down the rabbit hole a little bit with that. And when we made this weapon, we went back to those contents or those contacts and sent invoices along with the album cover, which was which was never we you know we changed concepts with the album cover, not with the invoices, and and then left it at that because it was just it was, there was a vacuum, there was just a void. No one really picked up. No one really picked up on it. Nobody really cared. And I have no idea again how this happened again, but we took advantage of it. Um, because it kind of caught us out of the left field so much so that we didn't even advertise our tour when we started giving interviews. We, um, we, uh, when, when, this, when this started up again, we uh, got in, in touch with uh, Terry Holbrooks, a soldier, who has now done um, an, an opinion piece with Al Jazeera and had written a book um, since I met him to now. And uh, again, kind of disappeared back into the woodwork a bit, tried to do as much as he can. Uh, he converted to be a Muslim uh, while he was at Camp Delta because of the empathy he felt for a lot of these people and married a, an American woman here who's a Muslim and tried to go on with his life, but he's suffering from ex excessive post-traumatic stress. And uh, when this happened, he was kind of almost hesitant to come out again and talk about it. Uh, another person who writes for Vice, and you might know, is Jason Leopold, who was trying to do a bunch of freedom of information requests to find out a list of songs um, and artists being used to torture and never got a response. And uh, so we contacted him and, and Terry and kind of revived the whole thing uh, during this last two weeks, basically, and then got a uh, direct... Uh, um, well, we had him actually had them send in the invoices again to contacts that they had within the Department of Defense and the Department of Intelligence. And when this finally circled around through telephone, whether we were a demonic techno band or, or uh, hard rock and Canadian death metalers or whatever, um, basically, I think it ended up with the BBC who had contacted the Pentagon. The Pentagon said at that point they could neither deny nor confirm receipt of the invoice. And that's the last that I've heard as far as a response from the Pentagon. I mean, it's a hell of a process. It's like, yeah. So it's you, interesting. How do you keep up with it? Uh, well, I mean, just, just day by day. I mean, we're seeing if it's, if it's something that's going to actually catch. So, I mean, sometimes I think it's a bit of a magic trick. It's like, look over here while this is happening over here. So um, at times, I think the reason why we're allowed to exist is um, in some way to um, show that there is freedom of speech in this country and you know we speak to a small tribe we speak to a small cult following of people but you know if we were a mainstream band would, would we be allowed to be doing what we're doing right now I'm hoping but I mean there's still a huge um, you know there's, there's so many states you can go to and you know gay rights you'll get the shit kicked out of you you know for, for like for like openly being gay or uh, there's still um, a massive amount of racism in this country, and, and it's and it's even within the highest levels of politics. Um, and with Obama, I mean, you're seeing. I, I just see it as outright racism, you know. Or what's happening in the Ukraine, you know, as a supposedly free European Union country that's being, you know, assimilated back into you know, the dark reaches of, of something that still has kind of a an icy cold grip, you know. Okay. Well, but you know what I'm saying. It, 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 it's 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 something that's almost you know uh, it's it's a term that 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 can be used by anybody. So, um, you know, how, how do I feel about that? I mean, it, you know, apparently he was he certainly knew the music, so he was using it. But I go back to uh, early tours where we were playing Germany and we were doing a tour on vivisection, and I had a, an articulated dog. It was a puppet that was made by an artist, stuffed animal that was fitted with a, an armature. And uh, I would manipulate it. And we were arrested in Cincinnati for right across the street from an animal testing 
facility for mutilating a dog on stage and thrown in jail overnight, released for disturbing the peace in the morning. But I mean, I sat there in a holding cell covered in blood with, with a bunch of black guys who were actually very nice and very cool. I learned a lot that night, you know, and, uh, and yet I, the, the detectives were lying openly to write their reports to, to, to wipe it clean. So we were let go the next day with the disturbing, uh, not disturbing the peace or, or, or something like that. And, uh, and that went further to when we were touring in Frankfurt, Germany, a bunch of military came out and, uh, and I walked off stage, they're like, man, that was a fucking great show. They're like, we really loved when you ripped that fucking dog apart. And I'm just going, you know, how, how much off can it get? So again, you know, I'm a flawed person and, and I'm still learning a lot as I go along. This has been the greatest learning experience for me in my life. And uh, I'm still, I'm not even as deep as you are as far as, you know, a lot of topical matters, to be honest with you. And I'm 51. So I appreciate the fact that there's people like you who are young and, and willing to eat this stuff up and willing to kind of look behind the curtain a bit because that's all I've done, probably to a fault. And, and um, you know, I felt the blowback from that. I felt certain aspects of COINTELPRO in this country. And uh, again, it's, 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 it's easy to demonize me, the drug addict, the ex-drug addict, the, the memnoc, uh, and, and yet there's people like you that have pen in hand and that pen is the real power and, and uh, your ability to transcribe my thoughts and, and my voice is what's important. And, you know, I'm 51. I don't know how much longer I have on this planet. But again, it's, it's, it's people like you that will carry on, you know, the truth or the lie, you know. Um, one last moment. After all that, what gets you going? What's that animating force that keeps you out there in the public, that keeps you writing, keeps you and your companion? Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've had um, a very interesting life that I don't look back upon with any sort of negativity. Um, everything that I've been through or that has happened to me or that I've done to myself has been a learning experience. Again, you know, I, I at times embrace hypocrisy because hypocrisy is a road to change and changing thought if you accept it that way. If you look at yourself and you're able to, you know, not stay in this button-down sort of reality construct I'm hoping that eventually we'll come to a place where there's a new a collective reality, not a uh, parochial reality that will um, will hopefully change this paradigm. You know? Thank you very much. It was an absolute pleasure to meet you. Thank you very much.